Good morning, HIF. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can everyone stand with us as we begin our time of worship?
Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, live for you.
Cheyette is one church with two locations serving over 50 nations. You're welcome to visit either Meeting or Westlake sites. While you're here, we hope you will connect with God and each other. Join a connect group in your area or interest to build friendships and build up your faith. Participate in our workshops to better be equipped to serve. Whether you stay for a short time or many years, leave a positive impact in the lives of others. Join a ministry team to serve others within HIF. Love the Noi by loving the people at work and in your community. Participate in the outreach activity through our city partners network. When the time comes for you to launch out of Hanoi, it's our hope that you'll be better equipped to serve God wherever you go. Let's take a moment to look at our announcements. Our Alpha course is launching this September. At Alpha, we desire to create a welcoming and open space to ask life's big questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? At Alpha, there's food, friendship building, videos we learn from, and discussion time where we can listen and learn from each other. Alpha is a place to just be yourself, to share your point of view. It's a place for all to come to learn the basics of Christianity. Please pray for a friend you can invite to Alpha. We are also asking for leader volunteers to help serve. If you're interested in serving with Alpha, sign up at hif.vm slash alpha or email alpha at hif.vm. Our leadership training will be September 3rd and 14th, and Alpha launches September 17th. Are you leading a connect group or interested? Or have you ever thought about leading a group but felt unsure and not know how to begin? Are you interested in discipling others, but want to be more equipped? This year, our focus is growing as disciples to grow others as disciples. Whether that's in a small group or in the one-on-one -on -one setting, we want to invite you to our discipleship discussion dinner to share vision, hear testimonies, and pray together. Join us September 5th, 6.30 p.m. at HIF Center. Sign up online at hif.vn slash connect. Good morning, HIF. Good morning. Two little announcements that weren't in the video. Um, if you're here before 10 o'clock and you'd like to join in in pre-service prayer, we have it every single Sunday, and it's in the boardroom just right across from us and right across from the coffee and the cookies. So it's in a convenient location for us all. And just one more, in with Alpha, in with your tithing and offerings envelope, you should have received an Alpha card. This is for you to Step out in faith and boldly invite someone out on Alpha. Maybe God's placed someone on your heart to invite them to Alpha. Um, please feel free to give them this card so they can look at the dates and also what the topics are going to be. But my name is Chelsea, and I want to welcome everyone here to HIF at Westlake. And we are just a community that really wants to genuinely get to know you and have you a part of our community. And if you are new here today, what we do every Sunday is we'd like to welcome those that are new by asking you three questions. Your name, where you're from, and how long you're going to be with us today. So if you're on my right or left side of the room, if you're new and this is your very first Sunday, we'd love to get to know you by having you stand up and sharing with us your name, your where you're from, and how long you'll be here. Is that anyone on this side of the room today? Feel free to stand up and the ushers will come give you the microphone. Anyone? Really? No? Oh, oh, no one's new on this side of the room. And we'll move over to this side of the room where if there's anyone who, this is your very first time here today, don't feel, don't feel shy, we'd love to get to know you. This is anyone's first Sunday, raise your hand. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, your whole group can stand up if you'd like. Yeah, right up in the front. Hi, 
moved from Virginia, and I'm going to be here for a couple of weeks. Miss Lee. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome. This is Sarah, my wife, and I'm Charlie. And I'm Steve. Welcome. Welcome. So glad to have you with us today. Anyone else on the left side or right side of the room? This side? Anyone else? All right. Well, only a few new people today. Wow. So good to have you with us. All right. And then as a transient church, we do have lots of people that come and go. And if you've been with us at HIF for six months or more, we'd love to send you off in prayer and blessing onto whatever God has next for you. So if this is your last Sunday, raise your hand and come on up to the front so you can receive prayer. Is this anyone today? I think I heard a no from someone, so we'll move on. No one. Good. Everyone's staying. Well, let's all pray for Kids Quest. Lord, thank you so much for our children here. Lord, thank you for the blessing that they are. And Lord, may you take this time and this space and this moment on this Sunday, and may you fill their hearts and fill their minds and shape them into who you want them to be, Lord. May you give wisdom to the teachers, and may you plant a joy in sharing with them who you are, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed to go to Kids West. And as the kids are leaving, let us transition to a time of praise and prayer for our country, our church, and this nation. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are the God who reigns, and hallelujah for that, that you are the God who reigns. Lord, thank you that you have us where you want us, Lord, in our jobs and in our ministries and in our schools and whatever what we're doing, Lord. Thank you for where you have placed us and what you've given to us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for our week that we had out in, out in your kingdom, Lord, and just thank you for everything. Thank you for all of your blessings into our lives. And Lord, there's, you're worthy of all the praise that we could ever bring of all of our part of our lives and everything that is from it is just a gift from you, God. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for HIF. And Lord, thank you for everyone who's serving, Lord. Lord, thank you for the churches in this city, Lord. And Lord, I also pray for this church, Lord, that you would rise up leaders as the new year has, new school year has come, Lord, and Maybe you're asking people to step out in faith in some areas of service, or maybe to step out in faith inviting someone on Alpha, or maybe just stepping out in faith and having that conversation with that colleague or that student or that friend, God, who is longing and is, who is desperate for you, God, because we're all desperate for you. Lord, thank you that you're using all of us here in this city and in this time and in this place, Lord, to be your light onto the nations and into this city, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for Hanoi, and we thank you for Vietnam. And Lord, may you pour out more of your spirit onto this nation and onto this city, Lord. May you use us how you see fit to use us to bring glory and honor to your name and to see the kingdom come in this city and in this nation, Lord, and all across the world, Lord. And Lord, may you rise up the Christians, and Lord, may you plant a desire in our hearts for others to come to know you and for you to be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you that even though there's nothing that we could ever do um, to bring you praise, Lord, thank you that you love us. And Lord, thank you for all the change that you've brought to our lives only because of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for Pastor Jason today as he brings forth the message Lord, may you anoint him, may you give him wisdom and how to speak, and Lord, may this be a time where your Holy Spirit is speaking to us and ministering to our hearts as well. And I pray this in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. Amen.
Lake. How's everyone doing? Good? It's a rainy holiday weekend. It's great to be over here this side of town. If you don't know me, I'm Jason, the pastor over at Lee Ding the last two years, and it's really wonderful to be here today, and maybe you're wondering why am I here. Well, Ryan, Pastor Ryan, our youth pastor, he's over at a meeting, uh, sharing about the Alpha ministry as we're starting it, just bringing our hearts together at meeting, and for us as a church to be praying for this wonderful ministry that God has been using. So he's going to share a word over there, and Pastor Yaakov is also over there uh, just with the body. And again, can I just say it's a real joy to serve alongside uh, Pastor Yaakov and Ryan. Um, it's wonderful that we have a youth pastor that wants to pour into our youth. So be praying for Ryan in his ministry and also Jakob as well. You know, we went a couple weeks ago to the government, the 47th uh, anniversary, um, or I'm sorry, the 74th year of the anniversary of the uh, police department. And so we went over there to just send our greetings on behalf of the church. And it, it's really wonderful to be with Pastor Jakob. You know, we have a, a great pastor who has invested so much in the relationships over the last five, six, seven years. So be praying for Pastor Jakob and the leadership that he has over a church. And it's just wonderful to serve alongside these brothers. And can I encourage you, if you saw that uh, Thursday dinner, if you're involved this Thursday, if you're involved in connect groups, want to be involved, want to take a next step into discipling someone, please come on out this Thursday just to get to know you, hear your heart for discipling others and leading a connect group. It's going to be a wonderful time to just share, pray together, and cast vision. With that said, let's jump into the Word of God, and as I say every Sunday at meeting, let's stand together as we tune our hearts to the Word of God. Would you sing with me Proverbs 8? We're finishing the book of Proverbs, and I've been teaching the congregation at meeting. Proverbs 8, the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. Let's sing this together. If you don't know it, you'll learn very quickly. We choose the fear of the Lord. We choose the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. We choose the fear of the Lord. Now that you know how it goes, remember we're finishing the book of Proverbs. The theme of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. And notice how it says we. We together as the body of Christ are making this declaration to the living God. Let's sing it together. Make this your prayer to the living God this morning. We choose the fear of the Lord. We choose the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. We Choose the fear of the Lord. And Lord, that is our prayer this morning. To come to you, not individually, but as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And Lord, for many of us, Lord, as we look back over the last week, we failed. We have not feared you. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us, Lord. We come with hearts to confess, Lord, where we have missed it this last week. And Lord, we come to you this morning knowing that the grace of our Redeemer is beyond comprehension. And Lord, we pray by the Spirit of God, would you pour that grace into our hearts. Give us ears to hear from the living God this morning as we open up the Word of God. And Lord, I just confess my own inadequacy. Lord, standing up here, Lord, I've fallen short in this topic, Lord. I know what I'm going to preach, Lord, and I still feel inadequate, Lord. And I pray, Lord, would you pull back another layer of my heart, Lord. Let this word penetrate deep into every one of us, Lord. And we stand with the brothers and sisters here in the city of Hanoi. The many churches, Lord, even in this building, Lord, our brothers and sisters next door as they meet. 
And we pray, Lord, would the Spirit of God fall in a powerful way to unite the body of Christ here in a deeper way, in a fresh way, Lord. Give a spirit of humility to the leaders. In Jesus' name we pray, would you do a fresh work in and through us. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. A joy of mine is getting to sing the word of God, as David said, your word have I hid in my heart. Letting the word of God sink deep into us through song is a wonderful thing. Well, um, several weeks ago, I gave a, a message uh, at meeting, redeeming money. And today, we're going to come to the end of our 11-week journey in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom is how to live skillfully in a fallen world. That is, wisdom is doing what's right, saying what's right at the right time. Today we're coming to part two of this message before it was at the joint services, so I know we've split into two locations, so I think many of us, I see a few here that were maybe at meeting when I gave this message, um, but this is the second part of this uh, message of redeeming money. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever went on the internet and kind of started searching, you know, who are the richest people in the world? You ever done that? I've done that, and you know, Bill Gates comes up top on the list. You know, his net worth is $102 billion. And that is just a mind-boggling amount of money, isn't it? $102 billion, his net worth. And, you know, as a person, he is equal to the 37th richest country on planet Earth. And he's just an individual. That's remarkable. As it, the average person spending $1, that's equivalent to him spending $1 million. Every second he makes $400. And get this, he's not only one of the richest men on earth, but he's also one of the most generous on earth. And that's not true for all billionaires. He's given roughly $30 billion away of his uh, net worth to charities, some very wonderful causes eradicating uh, global diseases. And it's actually, he said that he's trying to give away his entire fortune. But in a worldly sense, we could look at Bill Gates and say his wealth and generosity, no doubt it is remarkable. I mean, his generosity is very, very noble. I mean, he is an unbelievably generous person. But here's the thing. Compared to any other uh, person on earth, he's generous. But when you compare him to the generosity of God, all of a sudden he looks like a stingy person. He looks like an accumulator of wealth, a saver of wealth. Today we're looking, church, at the generosity of God. In part one, I know um, some of us were, were at this message. Part one, I talked about uh, what, what Proverbs has to say about money. And I said there that we first don't have a problem with money, but we have a surrender problem. When we look at our problems with money, it's first not a problem outside of us, but inside of us. And if we want to get at the heart of the matter with finances, we must see that money is a matter of the heart. And so if we don't begin at surrender, we will never see money as God intends us to see it. And so I shared this, this idea with money that God uses money, wealth, and possessions to actually reorient our hearts to full surrender to God. And Proverbs gives us three barriers that prevent us from doing that. We saw greed and foolishness and discontent. Those are barriers that prevent us having full surrender to this area of money. And then we saw Pastor Jakob several weeks ago. He talked about God's wisdom for work. And he helped us see how to honor God with our work, diligence and integrity. And as you know, what comes from work? Well, not only satisfaction and fulfillment, but money. We get money from our work. And so this brings us to part two of redeeming money. We ask the question now, what do we do with our money? In other words, how do we steward our resources and our possessions? What do we do with it? And if you've been in the church for any amount of time, I think regardless of what country you're from, I'm sure that you've maybe... Uh, you, you know that giving can be a sensitive topic among Christians. And maybe you've had a bad experience with the church or with the ministry and, and giving. And someone used guilt to manipulate you, to kind of get you to give. And it's true that people in the church have misused finances. That's a reality. 
But I'm not going to look at that. The first place we're going to begin is, well, as Christians, why should we even give? And how much? I've shared before in our series of Proverbs at Me Ding that Proverbs mentions over a hundred times the topic of, of money, possessions, and poverty. And my goal is to develop a deeper understanding for us of what we do with money. But I'm not going to begin in Proverbs. Today, where we're going to begin is I want us to see first that the Bible is a story of generosity. Listen, there is much at stake if we don't understand this. That the story of scripture from start to finish is a story of generosity. If we don't grasp this church, we cannot fully reflect the heart of God to a world in need unless we embody his generosity. We cannot fully be formed and shaped into the people of God unless we embody his generosity. We cannot fully mature as disciples of Jesus Christ unless the Spirit of God infuses our lives with a gospel-driven generosity. And so what we're going to see this morning, this big idea I want to put before us, is this. As receivers of God's generosity, our response is to reflect God's generosity to others. That's what we're going to be seeing this morning. And there's kind of a paradox here because actually giving doesn't first begin with giving. It begins first by receiving. And so as we dive into this story of generosity, let me give you a suggestion for how to listen to this message. Imagine when you uh, l listen like when you kind of watch one of your favorite movies. What do you like to do? Kind of hit the fast forward button and skip to the best parts of the movie, right? Your favorite movie, you want to just fast forward. That's what I'm going to do for us today, is I'm going to hit the fast forward button on this story of generosity and move us to the key parts of this story. And I want to do that because I know there are many new Christians here, and I believe some of us uh, that have been around the church for a while, and we just don't really understand how the Old Testament and the New Testament come together. And so I want us to see this theme of generosity, how it connects from the Old Testament and flows all the way into the New Testament. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to begin with this story of generosity. And you may guess where we're going to begin. It's Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, I shared this at meeting in our uh, series on Proverbs. In Genesis 3, we actually see man's quest for wisdom. Did you know that? Where man first desired to become wise. It says there in Genesis 3. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. And that it was desirable for, there it is, obtaining wisdom. And also we see in the creation account the concept of the material world there. The material world. We could say the, the wealth of God in the material uh, creation. It says there in Genesis six times God said it was good. And one time he says it was very good. So we can see here in the creation account one of God's attributes on display. That is his generosity. Now remember, God could have created the world any way he wanted. He could have created the world in a very simple, boring, and ordinary and plain way. But the Bible says that it was beautifully abundant. Genesis 2, it says what grew from the ground was pleasing in appearance. And so look around, you know this, God's generosity is magnificently on display. It is beautifully, gloriously complex, right? When we look out at the world. And we need to remember God didn't need to create it that way. But it is a showcase of his generosity. And there in the garden, when Adam and Eve, what happened at that tragic moment, there was an identity reversal. Instead of walking in surrender to God, Adam and Eve, they became self-rulers over their own lives, and they disobeyed. And ultimately, listen, church, what they were doing, they were doubting God's generosity in the garden. They doubted. They said it wasn't enough. What God gave them, they wanted more. That is why they took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so what happened, getting into this temptation in the garden, they corrupted their understanding, their view of God's generosity. They called it into question just like we do many, many times in our days and our weeks. We call God's generosity into question. 
We often think, you know, God, what you've given me, thanks, but no thanks. I want what you haven't given me. And we can become very resentful towards God, right? We can become very bitter towards God and angry because we think he is withholding what we deserve. That is why, church, generosity doesn't begin first by, it's not a money issue, it is first a heart issue, a trust issue. Do I trust that God is a generous God? And the more we begin to doubt God's generosity, the tighter we, in fact, hold on to our stuff, our possessions, our wealth, and we cannot reflect God's generosity to a world in need. Now, let's hit the fast forward button on this story here, and we're going to move now to the next chapter. The Bible says from Adam to uh, Noah, there's roughly 10 generations, and in that time span, well, mankind was not reflecting God's kindness and generosity. The Bible says that man had become corrupt in God's sight, Genesis, Genesis 6. The earth was filled with wickedness. So what does God do? Well, basically, God's going to start over with humanity, and he begins with Noah, the Bible says, a righteous man. And here, church, is where we see God's generosity in the covenant. The covenant. After the flood here, Genesis 9, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Does that sound familiar? Just like what God said to Adam and Eve. You see what God is doing? God is beginning his restoration project. And then God makes a covenant, a promise with the human race. Genesis 9, he says, I confirm my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by the waters of a flood. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. Here we see God's generous promise to humanity, restoring what was lost in the garden. And the covenants begin here and, and move all the way throughout the Bible. We see the covenant with Abraham and Moses, if you remember from our study in Exodus, and then to David and all the way into the new covenant. God's plan from the beginning was for man to be receivers of God's generosity and then to reflect it to a world in need. And could you guess who's the first person to reflect God's generosity? Abraham. Abraham. Now, weeks ago at meeting, we were looking at Abraham in, in the study on the fear of God. And did you know that Abraham was the first person, the Bible says, who walked in the fear of the Lord? Genesis 22. And also, I believe here after the flood, he's the first person that we see who reflects God's generosity to another person. Now, you might know the story there in Genesis 12, after that tragic failure with Abraham, lying to Pharaoh, right? You remember that? Giving in to the fear of man, not fearing God, he said to Pharaoh that his wife was his sister. And then what happened? Well, God eventually gave him some new land. And at this point, the Bible says that Abraham was quite wealthy. He was an international trader at this point. And also his nephew Lot was quite wealthy. Now get this, their wealth was actually a huge problem between them. If you have your Bible, open up to Genesis 13. That's going to slide off. Now let's look at Genesis 13. Now Lot, who was... Sorry. Now Lot who was traveling with Abraham, also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together. For they had so many possessions, circle that, <laughs> that they could not stay together. And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. You see the tension here. I mean, this would make for a great reality TV show in the ancient world at the time. I mean, here we have two wealthy guys from the same family, and they can't get along because they have too much stuff. There's not enough natural resources in the land, so there's a competition. And so here we have this uh, problem of survival, and how does it get resolved? Look with me, verse 8. Abraham said to Lot, Please, let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. Since we are relatives, isn't the whole land before you? 
Separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Look, uh, Lot looked out and saw that the entire Jordan Valley, as far as Zoar, was well watered everywhere like the Lord's garden and the land of Egypt. Do you see it? Do you see how Abraham demonstrated generosity? He doesn't keep what's best, the most fertile land for himself. He doesn't do what we expect. Hey, God chose me to make my name great. I get the best, la best land. What did he say? Lot, you have first choice. You take the most fertile land. You take what's best. Here we see this is remarkable. Generosity is used in solving conflict resolution. And notice how abundant the land was. It says, like the Lord's garden. That is an echo back to the Garden of Eden. It was abundantly fertile. And he says, Lot, you take it. He gave the best to Lot to choose. And so here, church, in the story of generosity, what Genesis is doing is shining the spotlight here on a man who has been touched by God, learning to walk in the fear of God, and he is learning not to hold on to physical, temper, temporary things, but looking on to spiritual things. It is the character of God, the promises of God. See, so he's learning to receive God's generosity so he can reflect it to other people such as law. See, for us, church, generosity is first. It is a sign of our faith in God's promises. God's promises, they are unchanging, and they reflect his attributes to us. So if we don't know God's promises through his word, we cannot fully reflect his generosity to others. That's why we must know the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy. We must know the promises of God in his word. Now, let's fast forward again in this story. Where do we come next? Well, we see God's generosity in the law and the land. Now, you know from our study in Exodus, Israelites, they were rescued from 400 years of slavery. They were poor. They were powerless. They were traumatized. They were ungoverned. They did not know how to live. And so in God's generosity, he blesses them with the most practical and beautiful of gifts, the law. The law of God and eventually the promised land. Now remember, what we saw in Exodus is that Israel, Israel, they were not deserving of the law. They were stubborn and they were a rebellious people. You remember what they were doing when, God, uh, when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law? Exodus 32, they were down turning away from God into idolatry, the golden calf. Now, here's the thing about the law. The law just didn't demand obedience. It's this gift to this confused and broken people. And it says how they should live before God and how they should live before one another and how they should handle conflict and how they should deal with outsiders in the surrounding nations and, and what to eat and business practices and so much more. But here's the thing. Because of sin that entered from the garden, now we have something called economic injustices and economic inequalities that have come that, that came into humanity and we can directly and indirectly trace them back to the fall. But here's a beautiful thing, church. In the law, we see God's generosity woven through the law. And we see it in how God says to treat the poor and the needy, those who were affected most by these injustices. Now let me show you. Look with me. Deuteronomy 24. If you have your Bible. Here we see. God is commanding the farmers. How to treat the poor. Look at what this says. When you knock down the fruit of your olive tree. You must not go over the branches again. What, rem what remains will be for the foreigner. The fatherless. And the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard. You must not glean what is left. What remains will be for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Do you see it, church? God's generosity woven through the law. Basically, God's saying, let the poor, let the needy go shopping in your land for free. 
That's what he's saying. Hey, when you go over and you knock down the olive tree, let the fruit fall and don't pick it up. When you go harvest and collect, don't collect it all. Let some of it be on the ground so the poor and needy can benefit from your generosity. This is remarkable. What societies do we see that generosity is embedded in the law code? Remarkable. Now, don't miss this. Take your pen or your highlighter in your Bible. Here's the reason why. Why does God say this? Look with me, verse 22. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. You see, they were once desperately in need. They once received God's generosity through rescue Freedom and deliverance. And so God is commanding them, church, to embrace this lifestyle of, of generosity. And it is first grounded in the reality, listen, the reality of redemption. The reality of redemption. God is saying, hey, remember Israel, you had nothing for 400 years. And now look at all that you have received from me. Remarkable. It's grounded in the reality of redemption. Now, in the law, when we look at more of it, we see God's generosity also when we come to the tithe, Leviticus 27. Now, tithe is an old English word that means to give a tenth. And the tithe for ancient Israel, it was not just a duty and an obligation. It was a way to express devotion to God. Devotion to God for all that they had received from God. In fact, the law required them to give 10% of their crops and animals. But when you break it down, as scholars have done, you can actually see all these other tithes and offerings. They were to, it totaled up to 23.3%. This is remarkable. And so when God called them to live this lifestyle of generosity, it wasn't a routine kind of check off the box. I got to give this month kind of mentality that we often have with our giving. Church, they were to take all of their material wealth, all of it, and they were to give it to the Lord. Look at what it says. Deuteronomy 14, each year set aside a tenth of all the produce grown in your fields so that you will always learn, here it is, to fear the Lord your God. You see, the fear of God, 18 times we see it in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord runs throughout the Bible. And we tend to think, church, the most spiritual activities we can do as Christians is like praying and reading the Bible and scripture memor memorization. And, and those are great things to do. But here we see reflecting God's generosity it is a way for the people of God, you and me, to grow in the fear of the Lord. When was the last time that we looked at our wallets and our possessions and our bank accounts as a way for us to grow in the fear of, the, of God? See, church, matters of money are first matters of the heart. They're matters of the heart. Now, we fast forward again. Are you tracking with me, church? You following along? Let's hit fast forward and we go to the next chapter in this grand story of generosity and we come to a section I believe is probably one of the most difficult sections to understand in the Bible. The reason is it's a lot of history and a lot of names. And we come to this part of the Bible where we see the kings and rulers. And in this we see God's generosity because God gives a system of, of leadership and authority. For Israel to, uh, to, to live under the reign of God through the kings. Now, this period begins, if you don't know anything about this period, just know this. It began as a golden age. It began with great prosperity and unity and wealth in the kingdom of Israel. That is, under King David and King Solomon. But you know the story. What happens? Eventually, things go Terribly, terribly wrong with God's people. There's civil war, there's conflict, there's idolatry, there's wickedness. And the kingdom of Israel splits between the northern and the southern. And God's people begin to drift away from the wisdom of the law of Moses. 
and they embraced idolatry. And listen, they disregarded God's generosity just like man did in the Garden of Eden. And they looked elsewhere. We need to remember what was God's purpose with Israel? Learning to receive God's generosity and to reflect it now, not just individually, but as a generous community. A community who practiced righteousness and justice and compassion. This would be their witness so all the people would glorify Yahweh and the nations would know Yahweh's name, Exodus 19. And do you know what one of the major sins that Israel committed? Oh, yes, it was idolatry, but, you know, it was oppressing the poor. You see, instead of generosity, they brought corruption. They fostered economic injustices and inequalities, and this church was a massive failure for the people of God to reflect his generosity to the least. And this is the backdrop for the prophet. You know the prophets? We have 12 minor prophets and 5 major prophets. Guys like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea. This is the setting of the prophets. And if you've read the prophets, I don't know about you, but I'm always scratching my head saying, when I read the prophets, I'm like, why are these guys so angry? I mean, why are they so upset? You see the tone that they write with. You see, the prophets, church, they were God's covenant enforcers. And listen, when Israel broke the law of God, they could not reflect the heart of God that is the heart of generosity. And so the prophets come on the scene and they speak passionately about social justice issues, how the people were misusing finances and wealth and how they were taking advantage of the poor. In fact, Malachi the prophet says, when you fail to tithe, you are robbing God. Amos says, you are trampling on the poor. Instead of giving to God, you're giving to idols. That's the language of the prophets. You see, Israel's failure to reflect God's generosity, it tells us that they no longer walk in the fear of God. And so we could say that God's generosity is seen in him giving the prophets. They were the spokesmen of God to bring the people back to love and loyalty. And so now we come to the next chapter in this story of generosity. And here we see God's gift in the book of wisdom. The book of wisdom is a gift of instruction for us on how to live skillfully in a fallen world. Doing the right thing, saying the right thing at the right time. And here we see wisdom and generosity. Have your Bible flip to Proverbs 3 or your iPhone, your device, Proverbs 3. We've made it now to Proverbs in this story. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, this echoes what the law of God said, what Moses said in the law. The law commanded to give the first fruits, giving your best. But how does giving your best, how does that honor God? How does that honor God? Have you ever wondered that? How does it honor God? You see, it demonstrates, church, that we have a gratefulness in our hearts for all that we have first received from God. Let me ask you, your generosity, our generosity, our giving, does it flow from compulsion, maybe man-centered kind of guilt, or just when we see needs and we feel real guilty, or does it flow from a grateful heart for all that, you've get, all that God has given you? A grateful heart, that's what we see here. Now, Proverbs going on to 29, it also echoes this, this generous heart towards the poor and needy. Proverbs 29 Verse 7, the righteous person knows the rights of the poor, but the wicked one does not understand these concerns. So here we see the heart of God reflected as it was reflected in the Old Testament law. Now there's a very clear contrast. That's how Proverbs work. Usually they contrast something. Here we see righteous versus wicked. Now what separates the two? Well, the righteous we see, they have knowledge. They have an awareness of the situation of the poor. But the wicked, you see, they have no awareness. They have no knowledge. 
They're unaware of, of those who are the most defenseless in society from economic and physical misfortune. And the truth is, church, in any day and age, right, giving to the poor, it's just you're not going to get anything back in return, right? When you work with the poor, you know that there's nothing to expect from them. But here we see, church, the wisdom of God's generosity says, hey, how you view the people who stand before you reflects how you are standing before God. Because the wise person is one that reflects the heart of God. And that is how we take up the cause of the poor and the needy. You may know of someone, John Stott, one of the greatest preachers of the 21st century, greatest theologians. He was called in 2005 one of the most one of the most hundred influential people in the world. And I found this very interesting at the age of 42, this godly man, this man of faith, he was preaching this proverb, and it, the story goes as he was preaching and studying this, he realized on this basis that at age 42 he was a wicked man. What a humbling conclusion to, to hear from such a godly man a man of influence in the faith, and for him to come to this conclusion. And I ask us, do we let the Spirit of God penetrate our hearts when it comes to caring for the needy? Or do we reflect a wicked heart? Moving on to Proverbs 14, you see, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Now, despise, it means to... To belittle, to mock, or to ridicule. And so in ancient Israel, we got to ask, well, who's the neighbor? Well, the neighbor in ancient Israel, it's the person when you would shake the tree and the fruit would fall. And the person that would come and glean, that's your neighbor. And Jesus said it this way in the story of the Good Samaritan, anyone who has a need is your neighbor. And so the Bible says despising this person is sin in God's economy. But notice the contrast here, blessed or happy is the person who reflects God's generosity to the needy, who, is, who shows compassion and mercy. You see, church, if we first haven't tasted the generosity of God, we cannot authentically and genuinely reflect it to those in need. And Proverbs gives us a warning of what happens when we turn inward and we hold our resources. Proverbs 14.31 says, whoever oppresses his neighbor is a sinner. Sorry. There we go, 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Do you see this, church? What's at stake if we don't act in generosity when we disregard those in need? It is equal to offending and showing contempt to the living God. I think we do this when we have no fear of God in our hearts. So here we see Proverbs, the wisdom of God and generosity. It reflects what we see in the Old Testament law and generosity. And it reflects what we see with Jesus in terms of how we view people, how we treat others, reflects how we are standing before God. Now in Proverbs, we also see the paradox of generosity. Look with me, Proverbs 11. One person who gives freely, yet gains more, another withholds what is right, only to become poor. A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. Now, this is a paradox because it just doesn't make sense on the surface, right? Let me explain. Now, first, the, the image here, the one who gives freely, this is an agricultural image for ancient Israel. It's the picture of a farmer scattering freely, throwing the seed, just without paying attention, freely passing out the seed. And you know, to have a harvest, you have to... Give out a lot of seed. And that's the principle. The more you sow, the more you reap. But that's not what we normally think, right? We think holding more of our possessions, holding more of our wealth, gathering up our stuff is how we gather more. But you see, this is wisdom's paradox here. It's the opposite. You see this? Gathering, in fact, you decrease. You lose. Why? Because our hearts are selfish. 
But you see, if we are willing to decrease by scattering and giving out, in fact, wisdom says that you increase. The more you give out, the more you gain. But this isn't what we normally think, right? Because my sinful nature and our sinful nature says, have a store up mentality, Jason. That's the flesh. The flesh says, have a me first mentality. The flesh says, have a doubting God's generous provision mentality. That's the work of the flesh in us. We have to be mindful of that. But here, look with me, verse 25. The generous person now is abundantly blessed. How? As they refresh others. As they enrich other people. And so the only way, church, to turn our material wealth and possessions into real riches in the kingdom of God, listen, is by generosity, by increasing in what matters most. That is the heart transformation God wants to do through our possessions and wealth. And let me just say something, because some of us might be reading this thinking, okay, I think I get this, Jason. This kind of sounds like if I give to God financially, he's going to give back to me financially. That is a false gospel called the prosperity gospel. And if that is your thinking, listen, that is evidence that the power of money has not been broken in your life. You don't possess money yet. Money still possesses you. And God wants to deliver you from that bondage. What this Proverbs is saying is generous living church it's as if you scatter a seed in this harvest because now the blessing is we get to become a channel of his generosity that's the blessing you see that is the blessing church that god has been restoring in the heart of man all the way back to the garden hearts that receive from him and hearts that can reflect his generosity now we come to the end of our story and we come to the climax of God's story of generosity. We come to the incarnation of Jesus Christ and there's no greater definition of generosity than these 15 words for God's love the world that he gave his one and only son. You see, the invisible God made his extravagant generosity visible. <coughs> See, for the whole story, God expressed his generosity to an undeserving people group. Abraham was an idol worshiper when God got a hold of him. But God generously gave to him the people of Israel. They were rebels, undeserving of God's generosity. But God still gave the law. And for centuries, Israel had forsaken the law and turned to idolatry, but God continued to pursue them with his generous love and loyalty. God gave the book of wisdom to a, um, a people that needed to be guided and were falling astray, and to us, church, today, living in a world that is ravaged by sin, in envy, in greed, and corruption, we are unable to function as God intended because of our self-love and our proud hearts. And we must be honest that today we are also deserving of God's judgment because we once lived for our own glory and not God's glory. Paul says it like this in Romans 1. We did not honor God. You see, what's the reality, though? The good news of the gospel is that God has not punished us with his righteous anger, but he has generously given us his transforming love and mercy in Jesus Christ. Amen? And we receive the generous gift of the cross of Christ. You see, Jesus, we are undeserving of him going to the cross willingly, suffering, being tortured, and going to the point of death, Paul says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you may be wondering, okay, Jason, I sense you're wrapping up here, but come on, tell me, as Christians, what do we do financially? How much are we to give? Is it 10%? I want to know. And my answer to you would be no. You, we don't give 10%. We give our entire lives. Because everything we have is God's. Everything we have is on loan from God. Christ 
bought us with his blood, Galatians 3. And that is what we celebrate today. Communion is a celebration, a fellowship meal, partaking in his generosity towards us. And so now all of life is infused with gospel generosity towards others. Now, when you look in the New Testament, in fact, nowhere do you see the exact amount of giving 10%. You see, that is the old covenant law, 10% to give. That was the rule. But we are now, church, under the new covenant. Paul says, though I died to the law and now I live to God. So here's the question. Why would we give anything less than the old covenant? Everything is greater in the new covenant. We have better promises. We have a better covenant. Everything, 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 everything is greater with Christ. So why wouldn't our generosity be greater? The heart of our Lord said, store up treasures in heaven. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so the only extended teaching on giving and generosity in the New Testament, we see Paul, he writes to the Corinthian believers. And he gives an example to them about some believers in a place called Macedonia. And here's what he writes. Look at how he teaches the Corinthians. He says this, 2 Corinthians 8. During a severe testing by affliction, their abundance of joy... And their deep poverty overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. I testify that on their own, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they begged us insistently for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. And not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves especially to the Lord, then to us by God's will. Do you see it there, church? Do you see it? They received the joy of Christ and they were able to reflect it to others. It overflowed in generosity. There was nothing forced about it. There was no great emotional appeal. Uh, uh, appeal. There was no giving campaign. There was no manipulation or guilt. And they weren't satisfied with getting away, giving the lowest amount of 10% and kind of move on. In fact, it says there, they begged. They were eager to give as much as possible. Now, how do we know exactly how much to give now? Paul goes on. Remember this. Here it is. What we've seen this morning. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has circled at, decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. We've come full circle. We see the wisdom of Proverbs here. There it is. The one who scatters and passes out increases. But here's the thing. What is different now in the new covenant? The amount to give is no longer mandated outside of us. It is no longer a rule external to us. But now it is internal to us. It is written on our heart. Generosity is the overflow of the heart. Church, it's the Spirit of God working in our lives, giving us this beautiful, unforced rhythm of generosity by the Spirit of God. And I want what they had, don't you? What a wonderful work of the Spirit of God here. Now, what did it produce? Look with me, verse 11. You will be enriched... In every way for all your generosity, here it is, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. We are enriched by our generosity because we grow a heart of thankfulness. And money cannot buy that. Money can't buy a grateful heart to God and the cross. As we receive God's generosity, church, our response is to reflect it to a world in need. Before we take communion, let me close with a question to us. If you were to look at your life over the last week or the last month, let's say it was recorded on a camera and it captured your last week or your last month and you went home today and you watched that movie of your life 
How well does it tell God's story of generosity? Can you see that story in your own life? Could other people see that story at work in your life? Now maybe, looking back, you might feel a little discouraged and ashamed. And listen, the fact is, we can't go back and change our past. But I believe, church, our best days are ahead of us. And so in light of God's story of generosity, why would we want to live lives that settle for 10%? Why not 15? Why not 20? Why not 30%? And can I just say this, kind of putting my heart out there to you, not as a pastor of HIF, but just saying this, opening up my heart alongside you as a brother in Christ, as a part of this church, when I think about my next 10 years in life, and I just think about where I want to be financial giving 10 years, 20 years. If God allows maybe 30 years out, I don't want to be anywhere near 10%. You see, in my life, I want to just value the riches that I have in Christ so highly. My position in Christ with him so highly and, and valuing my freedom from sin so highly and, and my adoption status as a, as a child of God, valuing it so highly and, and being united with Christ and, and being a citizenship in heaven, valuing it so highly and, and living in a way that values my deliverance from the powers of darkness, holding it up so highly and, and valuing that I am sealed by the Holy Spirit, valuing all this that we have received from our Redeemer and, and holding it so highly that gratefulness would overflow. Gratefulness would overflow and it would define a joyful, extravagant life in my life, in our lives, and it would be our worship to the Lord. And that is, church, how we're going to come to the communion table. Receiving from him first, his generosity. As you come up to the table, as you normally do, you're going to come up. And we're going to partake together. I'll lead us in communion. But as you take the cup and the bread and you go back to your seat, ask God, just refresh my heart for your generosity. Renew that desire to just continually receive from him. Let me pray we prepare to take this. Worship team's going to come on. Lord, help us to live lives that value this, all that we have in salvation, our inheritance that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, citizens of heaven, a child of God, all this, Lord, that we have received. And, and help us today as we just partake in your generosity that it would just produce in us this overflow of generous hearts that just want to express it to a world in need. Amen. You can come, ushers can come forward and prepare.
from the Lord what I pass unto you. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you break the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Lord, we thank you for your unending, extravagant generosity in our lives. Help us to live each day in light of the reality of redemption. And from that, Lord, we would overflow with gratefulness to express that to a world in need. And Lord, now as we prepare to take the offering, Lord, we pray that you would move in our hearts. We thank you for this church and all the provisions that you've given us for our facility and here and at me, Dane, Lord. We pray that you would use this uh, these resources for your good and your glory here in Illinois. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to prepare for the offering and finish in worship. Amen. Yeah. 
gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us as we leave that we would never forget the gospel, the wonder of the gospel, all that we have in Christ. Empower us to go out of these doors and to be a light to the people in need. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. If you would like prayer, we've got the prayer team up here. I'll be up here. Love to pray for you. Whatever it is that you're going through, have a great Sunday.